Ah, welcome, Michelle. <laughs> I hope that uh, Shavu is going to join us. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'm All later. Right. So, yes. <laughs> will you Will you just send him a message in Porsche? I I hope you'll receive the um, the link. Yeah, I did sure. resend I'll, it shortly. I'll so a, yeah, I'll send him right. a quick. Reminder. Let me let me start anyway, and um, okay. we'll get going. And then I can just share my she in my screen, and that when it's my turn. Yes, talk. yes, you should be able to okay. see it, uh, share it quite easily. So okay, let great. me just get that working and we're good to go, and we can start. Hang on, uh, what cost? Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, welcome Shabu. Um, we are going to be having this webinar which is from, from the uh, Department of Health, uh, the Joburg District Health Research Committee. Um, we have this monthly webinar. It's an opportunity for us to share a little bit of what's going on. Uh, my name is Shabir Musa. I'm a family physician in Johannesburg Health District working in Soweto. I also chair the District Research Committee uh, thank you and welcome for joining. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to have Shabir Mahdi speaking shortly, but I thought uh, it useful to share at each of these webinars a little bit of an, in, uh, an overview of what is happening in terms of research uh, applications within the district. I know that is a common problem that uh, people are struggling with and uh, complain about is that the applications are not processed well enough, quickly enough. So in terms of the Johannesburg District Research Committee, um, this is a spreadsheet or a, a table a chart of the applications that have happened over the last uh, you know, eight months, nine, 10 months uh, since January. Um, as a research committee, um, I was tasked to chair from about July. Um, these were applications that were sitting in the system and essentially we had to deal with the backlog that went all the way through to January, um, um, partly because there was a chair that was absent. Um, so in terms of um, applications, the actual number of applications uh, historically has been around 10. Um, in August, it jumped up quite considerably. So we not only had to deal with a backlog of six months, but an influx of new applications. And that is not going completely down back to where it was, um, so we're still seeing large numbers of applications rather than usual. Um, so this is just a, an overview of the applications as they have occurred over the last few months. An indication of those that we've resolved, you know, the ones that are in pink represent those that are not resolved. So we've got one or two applications from April and June um, where people have not brought, you know, provided certain key things and simply have not responded to us. Um, otherwise, uh, these are with reviewers and uh, are mostly being settled. I think what's really important for us to track as a committee is the turnaround times. And these turnaround times, we are measuring from the point at which the application is received, which we check on every day, uh, to the time that a letter is issued. It might be a letter that is um, a final official letter but it also can be a provisional letter where we've done everything and the only things that are missing is the 
uh, ethics uh, approval, which we expect before we provide um, a full official approval. So we've counted that and we, get a, we are getting a larger number of people who are uh, applying on that basis where we've said, listen, apply to us concurrently and we will give you a, a provisional approval. And we are getting a number of people who are doing that, using that opportunity, where it fast tracks you know, the whole process where we do it at the same time that the research committee, the ethics committee is busy with it. And right now we're down to 19 days as a turnaround on time to be able to provide you a letter. So I think that's even better than the ethics committees uh, at the moment. So um, I hope uh, that gives you some idea of where we're going. And um, in future, we'll share a little bit more of what we are doing as a committee, but very briefly. For now, thank you very much and welcome to uh, Professor Shabir Mahdi and his team from RMPRU. We've also got uh, on, on the panel, uh, Professor Yusuf Musa from the district, um, and there might be one or two other people from the district research committee will join us and look at um, uh, participating in this discussion. Um, Shabir, if you don't mind uh, putting up your video and uh, we can have a general chat. I don't know whether you'd like to share any presentation. I know we didn't really ask or request a presentation, but I think uh, it's okay if you don't have it. I think it's just a discussion. So. Um, Perhaps um, we could, you know, in, in, in introducing you in the post, we said that you are the dean elect of uh, Wits Medical School. I'm not sure when you actually formally take that post up. Um, and, um, um, you know, in that role, we would like to, um, you know, understand, well, perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about that appointment and your vision for uh, Wits Medical School. And I think the key question we would like to talk about is, how do you think we, as the Joburg District Research Committee, can work with WITS in, in improving research and research outcomes within uh, the Johannesburg area and broadly? Welcome, Shabir. So thanks, Shabir, and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone else. So thanks for this invite. Uh, so, uh, I mean, just to get down to it. Uh, so my position at WITS uh, starts on the 1st of uh, January. Uh, of 2021. Yes. And I very much look forward to it, including looking forward to engaging both with Jens, with the district health, as well as obviously with the health province. I think to a large extent, in terms of my vision, the success of us being able to train healthcare workers uh, in the fullest extent of the meaning of that word is completely dependent on the success in terms of the collaboration that exists between the university, between the faculty, uh, and the district health. Obviously, we base in Johannesburg, so Johannesburg District Health is a key role player, mm. as well as the province. Uh, and I think without a solid, robust working relationship, uh, it doesn't assist either the university, the faculty, or the Department of Health. Uh, for there not to be a solid working relationship. Uh, and we obviously not always going to agree. Uh, and I think that's given. Uh, there are different sorts of centers uh, in terms of what their focus is. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to be uh, looking at a bigger picture in that we're actually all striving towards a common goal and that is to provide a comprehensive and quality of care to people that live in Gauteng. Uh, and that is really where I'm st my starting point. Now, although I'm already taking on this position uh, from the 1st of January, when it comes to the relevance with regard to this particular forum, obviously I've, over the past 24 years now, I've been engaging with uh, the province as well as with the district, uh, with all of the research that we've uh, done. And certainly the success of our research wouldn't be possible without uh, the willingness of the Department of Health to basically facilitate many a time our ability to undertake research. And our research has, uh, is not just based at Veraguana Hospital. Uh, the unit is based at Vera, but uh, over the years, we've basically undertaken research in many primary health clinics, uh, including in Ecoreleni, including in, uh, as an example, in Eldorado Park, and almost all of the primary health clinics in Soweto. And I think there's huge opportunities. Uh, 
I mean, there's already opportunities that exist which we still, which we currently not tapping into in terms of what the unit is already doing currently and how the district itself can actually benefit from it. And I'll give you some examples of that. Yes. But beyond that, there's just ample opportunity in terms of what the faculty can do together with Johannesburg District Health as well as with the province in terms of bringing together a really tightly knitted group of people that can sort of overnight change the manner in which we go about uh, having data available to us to make informed decisions as to where the gaps exist and what can be done to address the gaps. Mm -hmm. So as an example, one of the things that my unit, one of the programs which is uh, really close to my heart and which is fundamentally changing the way we think about child health, maternal health, and what needs to be done to address issues related to, to childhood mortality is the CHEMS program, the Child Health and Mortality Prevention Surveillance Program. Yeah. And that program is very much grounded in the community to start off with. Uh, and what it basically entails, for those of you that don't know about it, is the focus of the program is around uh, trying to get a granular understanding as to the causes of child death, under five child death as well as stillbirths. And up until now, globally, especially in low income countries, much of our understanding in terms of the reasons why ch children die is based on verbal autopsies and vital registration. And neither of those are specific enough in terms of getting, getting a granular understanding of the causes of death, which enables you to determine what sort of interventions are required. So we sort of, uh, you know, the way almost piloted or pioneered the initial data that was generated from what is known as minimal invasive tissue sampling. We, after the child dies, after getting consent from the parents, and I'm not going to go into the detail on this yeah. procedure, uh, we basically do sort of uh, uh, biopsies of different organ systems. We do a whole lot of array of tests. And from that, for the first time, I can honestly say that we now know why children die in South Africa. Everything before then was largely guesswork. And even based on the type of investigation that's done anti-mortem, often that is only about one third specific in terms of the exact reason for a cause of death. Now that type of granular information assists us in terms of identifying also which of the deaths could have been prevented. Uh, where did a death occur because of a shortcoming that might have existed in the clinic or a shortcoming that might have existed in the hospital? Now, this is data we've accumulated over the past 67 years. And right now, we have a dozen children that have unfortunately died, that we've got this granular data, able to unpack exactly what the causes of death were, of the death was, as well as what were the factors that could have prevented the death. Uh, be it that a mother that the mother went to an antenatal clinic and uh, the, uh, the proper procedure was not done as an example. So that's where we are right now. But what we also have been able to do, which really speaks to primary health care, is that we've set up an HDS, a health demographic, demographic surveillance site, uh, which includes eight clusters, six in Soweto, as well as uh, Tembalishle, two just uh, in an informal settlement in Tembalishle which is close to the nature south. And now what we're able to do is look at what are the socioeconomic factors that might be contributing to childhood death, to poor pregnancy outcomes, to adverse pregnancy outcomes. Now, laid on top of that, a key focus of CHEMS is maternal, uh, is pregnancy outcomes. And what we've been doing over the past, or past five years or so, is that we've developed a maternity registry by like every delivery that has taken place across Soweto in Perguana's hospital and in each of the clinics, right? We've systematically captured each of those deliveries, right? Now we've got this huge database uh, and at the press of a button, literally everything which the primary health nurses are expected to report on when it comes to the number of deliveries versus fixed years, preterm birth and everything else, we can literally generate it from our unit. It's a huge investment that we've, taken on, we, we've needed to make an investment, we've done investment, but that data simply is not being utilized for where it can be used. Uh, so that is one example. Okay. Uh, something close to my heart is immunization, right? And we've completed a vaccine coverage survey that was done nationally, but that gives us ideas in terms of what's happening at each of the districts. Now that type of survey costs millions of rands to do. 
uh, where that money could be better spent by investing structures in structures that are put into the clinics where at a press of a button you will be able to generate the same type of information rather than going to every house to all these uh, thousands of households every 10 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. to sure. do a one-stop exercise mm -hmm. and those sorts of opportunities exist right and i think it's really for us to see how we can bring those to materialize yeah. so let me pause there and yeah no no thank you i think that's very useful thinking um so you basically um have got data that you're collecting in the community in the facilities of johannesburg and that that is possible for people to actually access that data and then in fact in turn, longer term you feel it's more in, worth investing in developing that infrastructure um, more solidly within the clinic service so that more data might be more available um, on the same basis no thanks for that and i think that 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 speaks to the opportunity for Vitz yourself and Vitz to be able to speak to um, that um, a collaboration with Johannesburg in a way to look at making research much more easier to do. Uh, do you think that I mean you've spoken of the sort of RMPRU and the way in which you are as you know with your career in, in research doing stuff in the community primary care. Um, in terms of Vitz as a whole, do you think that there is enough of an emphasis on primary care research um, in, in our setting because Johannesburg is, you know, people tend not to know the, the extent of Johannesburg, but also that Johannesburg is a large primary care facility uh, and is dwarfed by the hospital, but it is actually quite substantial. Uh, any thoughts around that? And I think the other colleagues on the call on the panel will, will ask you some other questions. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think, I don't, I mean, I was at a meeting yesterday, one of the dinner meetings, uh, and my comment when one of the schools were presenting is that, uh, and it applies equally for whether it be primary health care or uh, sort of hospital based uh, health care. Hmm. I think it requires, applies equally, is that we're not tapping more than 5% of the potential for the type of research. Right? And I'm talking of translational research, I'm not talking yeah. of research for the purpose of doing research. I'm talking of research which basically can inform how to better organize ourselves and how to get a better outcome. We're not tapping more than 5% of what actually exists in terms of potential. Mm. I mean, we it's a place such as, uh, and I know I know Johannesburg is bigger than Soweto, but Soweto is a big part of Johannesburg. No, true, true. But the type of work that you're able to do and the type of uh, things that you're able to implement as a sort of uh, proof of principle, right, uh, in Soweto is completely unparalleled. And I won't, be the, I won't be exaggerating when I say it's unparalleled in the entire world. Uh, and that is simply because of the structure of the healthcare system here. There's almost no other place that you go to where 90% of the population are dependent on two, uh, in, on two hospitals for access, right? And that somehow integrates with all of the primary healthcare clinics. Right, and it just, it's almost criminal that we haven't moved into the 21st century mm. in terms of the manner in which we can bring about some sort of structure uh, when it comes to simple things such as uh, patient information, mm. right? Uh, and there's just ample opportunity. Uh, so the short answer is that we're not tapping more than 5% mm. of the potential. And I'm not just talking of communicable diseases, I'm talking of non-communicable diseases, yeah, I'm talking of maternal health, it's just broad. And I think now, I mean, it's really, right now, it's said that we've still got an open canvas hmm. in terms of what we want to do. If you go to other places in Mozambique, uh, those places are so jam packed with researchers, but all of those researchers are not from within the country. They're all from the Northern Hemisphere and they completely saturated. So as an example, the country in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, we did an analysis. The country with the highest output in terms of publications per capita of the population related to vaccines is Botswana. Oh, wow. Okay. But when you look at all of the publications from that country, right, none of them are written by anyone from Botswana. It's all people from Boston and everywhere else. Mm. Now, we're fortunate we've been able to guard against that. But at the same time, we're not actually, that is an example of the amount of work that can be done in the setting if you've got the right skill set in place to do the work. Hmm. Right. So I think the potential is just absolutely 
Well, I think that's that's wonderful, and I think we need to just take it from here that we have a discussion separate out of this meeting where we bring together key stakeholders and maybe go around with a small team to look at facilities and understand, I think, some of the work you're doing, what can be done in other places. So thanks for that. And I think that we need to we need to engage. So thanks for that. Yusuf Musa is also on the DRC and, and has some questions related. Yusuf, do you want to ask the question, which I think is about how do we get more than just you know the, the the academics within the uh, within the Joburg Mental Health District involved. You yes, sir. Yeah. I'm... <clears throat> okay. I think. Uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm yes. unmuted. Uh, we can hear but, you, and you can um, see a video. But uh, okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, well, th thank you, Dr. Dr. Mahdi. Um, we, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your appointment and uh, we look forward to working together. Uh, I think as uh, Shabir has indicated that some of the ideas that you have uh, mentioned uh, sound very exciting and uh, we hope that uh, these collaborations will materialize and we certainly feel that we will benefit not only research in this country, but also assist in improving services in the district and being more efficient and smarter in the way we operate. Uh, I just want to ask you a question uh, or to pass this by you. We know that the university uh, supports students to a great deal in terms of their research. Uh, obviously, it's as part of their requirements, they get uh, training on in conducting research and also assistance with regard to research uh, uh, protocols and, and research uh, write-ups. Now, in the district, we would like to encourage research amongst what we would term as non-students, student um, staff who are not affiliated to any university. Obviously, they're working and they don't have the benefits that students are exposed to through the university. Uh, what we'd like to know, is there an opportunity for the university to be able to come into the district and to help and assist people, encourage people in, in terms of research and how to go about the process of research? Uh, that's my question, the first question that I'd like to ask. Thanks. Thanks, Shabi. If you can respond to that, uh, Prof. Mahdi. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you, sir. So the, the short answer is that uh, with absolute no investment, with absolute no further investment on the part of the faculty, uh, that sort of uh, support can be uh, provided almost immediately. So the faculty has got a number of courses that it runs for, as you pointed out, mainly postgraduate students. And those are sort of basic courses in terms of research strategy, grant writing, which probably won't be too important right now, uh, but just simple thing about statistics. Now those courses are run and they're open to postgraduate students. And there's absolutely no reason why the faculty shouldn't be able to enter into an agreement with the district uh, to allow for the staff in the district to be able to access those because when those courses are held, it's not to say that we've got 100% occupancy in terms of people that sign up to a course. And those courses are run about three, many of them are repeated two or three times a year. So the short answer is yes. There's, I mean, again, it's just an issue of opening dialogue. Yeah. And the fact that this hasn't happened up to now uh, indicates that there hasn't been that sort of dialogue that should be taking place. Mm -hmm. So short answer, yes, that opportunities in terms of supporting people that have got an interest in research to get better skilled in doing so definitely exists and happy to basically champion it as soon as I get into office early next year. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's wonderful. Um, Dr. Prof. Luvengo is sort of is quite confident in a, in a comment he makes in the question that he's confident that the collaboration that the incoming dean is talking about will increase output. We notes that uh, the faculty's output is plateauing uh, for some reason. So I'm sure you'll have that insight. Um, so there's a, 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 another panelist, who, a person who's part of our committee. We've actually tried to draw in uh, the, the Department of Family Medicine's uh, research director, I think you might know him, Joel Francis. Um, Joel, any questions? I think, uh, and we've got also Dr. Michelle Toluto, who's asked a question, but let's ask Joel if he's got any questions. Uh, 
Thank, thanks, Prof. Musa, and uh, thanks, Prof. Mazi. Uh, you don't have any question at the moment. Maybe I'll be able to ask a question later. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, Michelle, who's Michelle Tolute, is a family physician in the district, and this might be more the sort of joint appointees, <clears throat> which I think you'll have to have on your agenda. And she raises the problem that is there a way to um, create a research stream, a, uh, you know, in, in academia, um, because of the challenge with uh, you know teaching and clinical work in the district, uh, how do we find ways to support what is a growing element in the district health system of joint appointees? Yeah, so uh, Michelle, I think that's a really important point. And when you look at globally in terms of what's, which groups have been most successful with the research agendas, it's not groups that have been self-centered and look in a small area. It's groups that have been successful in terms of developing networks. So one of those networks that comes to mind was what was known as a picnic uh, network in Canada, which started off on RSV. And, over, and so they started a small project looking at the burden of RSV, and over time that has evolved into something that just transcends everything else. But organically, what they were able to do is take a specific topic, develop a network, everyone inputs into the network, and over time, people start developing ownership of different aspects of the network. But all of the sort of sort of uh, core work is sort of coordinated and then rolled out. And it's really, but then it's really dependent on people wanting to buy into that concept. So in South Africa currently, uh, they, there are some cent what they call centers of excellence, which are more sort of lead based uh, scientists that have come together to sort of transcend across uh, institutions and pool their resources. And they've been fairly successful. But the same thing doesn't exist in the field of primary health care. And I think there's ample opportunity for that to do, for it to uh, exist. And certainly getting it started in Kauteng again is something which at probably nominal cost, we would be, you can actually get it started, but it's only as successful as the role players want it to be. Right, so we need to get people that are committed to that agenda. And if we are able to get people that are committed to the agenda, I can sort of, within my own unit as an example. So a good example is what I was describing in terms of this maternity register. So here we've got my unit sending someone out to every clinic in, her, in October to collate on a daily basis all of the deliveries. Right, now that is not necessary, we can use the money that's invested in that one person to run around and we can set up an electronic system right across all of these clinics overnight right and have one person in date on that and that is much more sustainable that date becomes available to use uh, it becomes available for the researchers for the admin staff and everyone else to use so i don't think it's an issue of not having money it's an issue of vision Right, and in the issue of uh, the role play of the stakeholders wanting to actually form part of this sort of an initiative. Uh, so, and at the end of the day, I think that the greatest beneficiaries of this sort of exercise eventually are the people in the clinic. And the amount of opportunities that evolves from that in terms of publications is that uh, there simply wouldn't be any competition because people won't have enough time to write up if that's where the interest is, the number of publications that this sort of uh, opportunities uh, present itself. And a good example, so COVID-19 is an excellent example where we can actually use COVID-19 as a starting point to do exactly what I'm describing. So we're looking within the next six months, as an example, we're going to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. Included in that is a huge issue about the safety of these vaccines. Now, when I talk of safety, it's not just about a person that presents to the hospital, it's right across a platform. So setting up a system now in Jova, which basically works, figures out how we're going to capture every individual that develops a COVID, that receives a COVID-19 vaccine, how we're going to follow them up, even be just facility-based follow-up, and how we're going to address the issue of effectiveness and safety of the vaccine is something that we can start planning for now. And in six months from now, we can get kick-started the sort of a platform. So the opportunities are endless. And it sort of transcends primary health care in terms of service delivery, in terms of immunization, 
right through, through to looking at what is the theoretical risk of enhanced disease because of people being vaccinated. So an example of something which we not prepared, we, uh, currently we don't have the platform to do what I'm describing, but that platform is essential, right? And it's a type of platform which we can, uh, which I personally, as an example, can sort of recruit the funding. There are people that are interested in funding this, right? But there isn't a platform for them to put it, for them to put their money in. Mm. So this is sort of a COVID opportunity, which unless we exploit it now, it's going to pass us by. And instead the same sort of work is going to be done in Zambia or mm. Kenya, but it's going to be led by someone from John Hopkins or Boston yeah. University. No, true. Thank you. And I think that what we need to do is, is just deepen this discussion we've talked of um, that we take outside. How do we build this collaboration? And I think you've, you've presented some ideas, uh, clear ideas. I think what we need to do is engage with the right stakeholders to get the collaboration and network about. Uh, Yusuf, you had another question. Do you want to pose that question to Prof. Mahdi? If you can yeah. lift your screen, right. yeah. Uh, sorry, there we are. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Mari. Again, it's uh, it's not a uh, uh, very high uh, uh, a thing of importance as importance as you've been discussing, but it's something that I thought maybe we having you here, we might have the opportunity to uh, put the uh, seed into your head for the moment. Uh, as you're aware, the, the process, most, a lot of research that is being done, apart from uh, research entities, would, are done by students, postgraduate students. And the process from the time that they apply to the district committee uh, for, their, uh, for their permission to the time when they complete the, the final report is, is a good few years. Now, the problem, uh, the way I see it, that what happens is we, not, we do not get back the information about what was the outcomes of their research and what were some of the benefits or recommendations that we could implement in the services. Now, unless that, uh, in that particular, this thing goes into publication, but otherwise we're not familiar. So I was wondering that if it could be that prior to a student finally getting his, uh, his degree, that there could be a requirement by the by the university that a report is submitted back to the district research committee a brief report on what were the important findings and what were the recommendations i think it would benefit us in a great deal of looking at this to see how we can improve services because often there's valuable information there which we are not privy to that's my question thank you Thanks. Yeah, so again, it's an issue of opening up the channels of dialogue here. Yeah? The reality none of those can actually qualify without that report having been peer reviewed by, because it goes through an examination process. And only after it goes through an examiner, examination process is the student allowed to uh, graduate. So there's absolutely no reason why, as part of the process, uh, that after the person has been after the thesis or dissertation has been approved, that that is not actually sent uh, to the stakeholders, uh, even as an FYI. Obviously, internally at your uh, health, you're going to need to figure out how to do the sort of review, not review, but what you're going to do with that piece of dissertation. So internally, you need to set up structures that is going that's going to take the time to read through each of these. But in terms of the actual flow of information, again, it's almost, it's, it's not almost, it is a no brainer in that there's mm. nothing that actually stops us mm. from actually forwarding the, what is eventually the approved, uh, approved pro the thesis or dissertation uh, to Joburg District Health. Yeah, no, I think we, we in fact have already tried to start a be beginning that process of requesting researchers who have been um, given permission um, for a year, a year ago to say, listen, you, sh you should have, you agreed to an annual report, please provide us that. And people are responding and providing sure. us information, which is great. So, Shabira, I mean, the, you also don't want to make it too burdensome. Uh, no, so, course. an annual report, I mean, many of the students are struggling and then they need to do the annual report in the midst of them writing the final exam. Yeah. So, I think from, from your perspective, it probably makes more sense 
to have something that's a complete product. Sure. Right? Unless you've got some concerns that there are ethical issues or there's some disruption of healthcare services because of the research, it makes more sense to have a complete product so that you can take your time and go through it and then decide how to actually mm -hmm. implement. I think does, it does make sense. I mean, at the moment, uh, it's it's kind of almost historical that an annual report is requested, um, but it's not even in, you know enforced at all. And all we've asked is for people to just simply send us something now. Uh, but I think that uh, the point is important is that we do get people sharing the information. We've posted it up. Uh, we've actually tried to review it in a group of people that have, that are willing to support us and uh, putting it up for now. But I think we've got to assimilate it find it a, a way to translate it into information that is easily understood by managers who are not necessarily researchers. And I think that's our task as the committee. Um, some of the challenges we face, and I think as Yusuf says, we need to get you know, research, we need to get interest in research. People need to be invested, like you said, in the fact that research is matters. Uh, and I think we need to sort of improve the understanding of it as well as, um, you know, get them to um, try out to be researchers. As a researcher, an experienced researcher, what would your suggestions be on, on us building capacity amongst, you know, academics and non-academics within the primary health care setting of Johannesburg or any other district? What are your, uh, you know, tips as a, um, as a long-time researcher? So I think what the big, one of the big challenges that we face uh, when it comes to research is that people see research and service delivery as being at different ends of the spectrum, sure. when that is not actually true, and mm. even less true when it comes to primary health care. Mm. You can't be uh, providing quality primary health care without informed decision making. And the only way you can get informed decision making is to analyze where you are and then decide how you're going to get to point B. And that requires assimilation of data. So we want, to, so maybe we should stop using the word research to make people talk. <laughs> but we need to be able to assimilate data in a very systematic manner, mm. right? And I think it's really necessary for that to filter through, right through the spectrum. Mm. I and mean, then I'm not talking of nurses, I'm not talking of doctors only. It needs to go down to the nurses, it needs to go down to the pharmacists, it needs to filter through. That if you want things to be informed in terms of how to improve your service, Right, you need data to inform that, mm. right? And then you need to put into place the systems to basically sort of get good data together. Yeah. Uh, and it's really the change in mindset. And I think with the, one of the challenges, like you said, it might be because we've got people from outside coming in for a few months doing their work and then buzzing off without any mm. feedback. So that mm. might be one of the challenges. But the staff in the facilities, need to be at the forefront of the simulation of the data. Mm. And what it means is that we need to look at what tools we can make use of, right, to get data with very little disruption. Now, I think one of the big challenges we face in South, in South Africa, including Edward itself, right, is that we simply haven't made this transition from paper from paper copies to electronic data. Yeah. We haven't made a transition. And it doesn't mean you need to capture everything on, uh, on a database, right? You need to capture a few basic issues, a few basic uh, variants, variants, and that would assist you in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Hmm. And we, unless we do that transition, right? And unless people become comfortable with it, the other big problem is that a large part of our workforce are simply, are simply averse to going electronic. Despite them all having cell phones and being able to do everything on a cell phone, for some reason, they can't see themselves sitting in front of a laptop or a computer to punch in a few things per day. So it's a mindset that needs to, we need to start off with, uh, a change in mindset, uh, both in terms of being adaptable to tools that will assist us with that particular goal, but also we need to have people understand that the reason they're gathering data is not for the benefit of one or two people that might want to publish on it, but it's something that's going to assist them in terms of better informing how they go about doing things in a much more efficient way with the better outcome at the end of the day. Yeah, in fact, I think, um, you know, a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of the challenge, and I come from a meeting just now with the health, the district management team um, is that there is currently data 
that is within the health system and that's the district health information system um, and the same with additional databases the tier.net etc there are some useful databases the ch challenge is the collection of it the fact that what is actually put in is that process actually correct and many a times that validity is a big challenge um, and um, one of the difficulties we are facing and which we as family physicians have to provide is critical thinking. What do you do about what you're seeing um, and make sense of that? Um, I, I wonder, uh, are you familiar with the databases of the current district and the initiatives for electronic health records uh, within the, uh, the Gauteng Health? Now, I know you've raised this issue about electronic data capture and data capture. And I love the idea, um, but I know it's fraught with problems within the health system within Gauteng Health. I think it's one of those things that uh, speaks big money and uh, you know, tenderpreneurship. But I think that's a huge challenge. How do you think we can, um, are you familiar with the, the public service initiatives? And how would you suggest we negotiate that process uh, with the ideas you raised? Yeah, I'm familiar with the with this public health initiative, which was supposed to have rolled out uh, probably- De Decades ago. <laughs> years ago. When it started at the NICD. Uh, when I started to discuss issues around a similar sort of concept with the Department of Health. And obviously six years later, we haven't made much progress. Uh, mm. And I mean, it's, it's something as simple as a unique patient identifier. Yeah. Uh, some places have been successful in rolling out, others have said that they're rolling out, but in reality it doesn't exist, mm. uh, which is a problem. And I think for Joburg, it's really to look internally as to how it can sort of go for the low ending fruit in terms yeah. of being able to at least initiate the process that leads us to something which a national eventually wants to aspire to. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously it requires funds. So I'm not going to kid myself that it doesn't require funds, but you can start off small. Yeah. So again, as an example, my passion is on vaccines and immunization. And you can start off at that level. Right, uh, it's a proof of concept in terms of how things should work. So start yeah. off just with uh, child health as a starting point, right? Make sure that every child that enters our facilities is allocated a unique patient identifier and enforce that it actually needs to be used. Mm. And then develop some sort of a basic data base mm. to be able to track what happens to children. Right, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going into the privacy issues and everything else. I think that's ways to mm. deal with that. Yeah. But I think unless we go that route, right, we're going to have the same discussion in five years from now when I finish my first term, yeah. uh, and we wouldn't have made any progress. So the, what I'm proposing is simply not doable mm. uh, without going beyond where we are right now, and which means that we need to go the electronic route, mm. uh, or else there's very little opportunity to make a difference. No, thanks for that. I think we'll pick up the conversation in a separate, you know, meeting outside of this and see how we can um, we can facilitate this collaboration and, and do something substantial together as the university and uh, the district uh, you know, in which the university is. I don't know if there are any other questions, any other points people would like to raise. I think we've uh, used the opportunity quite extensively to pick Prof. Mahdi's brains. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Um, we have, you know, the, the Department of Family Medicine, um, you know, substantially in the district and the department has got a research director. Uh, perhaps I can just ask Dr. Francis uh, to, to talk about what his role is and, and how do you think we could, um, you know, as the, as the dean of the, of the faculty, how would you um, relate to that? And do you see a way to collaborate with that initiative? So, Perhaps you could just ask Dr. Francis to share kind of briefly his role in the department and, and how he sees his role also as a member of the district research committee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, so maybe I should start with my role. So my role is to support the um, academic research activities uh, for both staff and the, and the students. So in terms of uh, students, it's mainly uh, the supervision of uh, PhD student, PhD candidates and um, MED um, candidates who are supervised by other colleagues, but I offer uh, research support and guidance where it is needed. 
uh, in terms of staff, it's mainly um, you know collaborating in uh, research that is carried out in primary healthcare settings. Uh, my area of interest is mainly substance use, uh, in particular alcohol use and um, HIV and mental health, depression and anxiety. But I also work with um, other colleagues in the department in different areas uh, as, ne as, as needed. So uh, in, 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 in terms of Joba District uh, uh, Research Committee, uh, you know, I've been mainly involved in reviewing the protocols to, uh, to, to make sure that they align to what is expected and uh, it's offering uh, what is supposed to be offered on the ground. Uh, but I hope in the future, because I'm a new member in the, in the committee, I'll be able to collaborate with um, colleagues in the district uh, in different research activities, mainly those um, focusing on my area of interest, but also in other areas. So I, I, I managed to, you know, to, to, to cut out my responsibility in, in this role because of um, my background is uh, medicine, even though I'm not practicing. And then I studied the epidemiology at the master's and PhD level, and um, I've been mainly engaging in um, research activities. So, Thanks, um, uh, so our department and um, Prof. Mad, I think, you know, we, we need a lot of support in one or the other, but then the motivation is there. But I hope we, you know, we, we, we have the opportunities and we'll be keen really to work with you closely uh, to spearhead the research agenda of the department and the research agenda of the other uh, province and the university at, at large. Yeah. Just quickly before Prof. Madi responds, uh, what sort of areas of um, research interests in the department briefly? Uh, so we, we, we have, uh, we have um, mainly the health science education. Uh, we have also colleagues working in health systems, uh, Prof. Musa and, uh, and the colleagues. And we have uh, a group that is focusing on non-communicable diseases. Um, and so we, we, we don't have uh, any individual work mainly focusing on HIV, STI, and TB, but that's also an area that we've identified as one of our area of interest. And uh, we have a few colleagues who are working on bioethics and maternal and child health. And, uh, and I, know, I know Prof. Cook, who is our head of department, is mainly focusing on COVID, COVID research at the moment. Yep. So I mean, being family physicians, I suppose, all over the show. Prof. Madi, do you mind responding to that? Do you think that uh, there's a place for family medicine to provide some leadership in this process? I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, without, without any question, I, I mean, I, it's not me that's going to lead this yet. No, sure, it has sure. to be someone else. Mm, uh, sure, sure. And it's really, and I think with the sort of uh, existing relationship that family medicine has got with Joburg District Health, it makes perfect sense for family medicine to take the lead. Hmm. Uh, and it's really we were sitting down and sitting down with Joburg District Health, obviously, in terms of deciding on what the agenda should be. Yeah. Uh, and to get both stakeholders to buy into it, because unless we get everyone on the same page, yeah. uh, it becomes a frustrating exercise. From the university, uh, I can't think of anyone else better place uh, than family medicine. And you probably want to include some people in the School of Public Health mm -hmm. uh, to be part of the process as well. They can bring a different dimension, but it needs to be led uh, from the Department of Family Health, you being the principal sort of stakeholders with uh, Joburg District Health in the faculty. No, that sounds fun. Thank you. And we'll take it up uh, as we go forward. So thank you very much. So thank you to the uh, to to the Prof Mahdi. I know he's going to still present, and uh, Prof Mahdi is, and his colleagues have agreed to um, provide us uh, some insights into um, work that is being done by RMPRU. I just want to find. Um, let me just quickly find the information. Sorry, there it is. Um, so we had agreed to, sorry, um, to get colleagues of his to present. Um, let me just find the webinars. And the colleagues are Prof. Madi himself, uh, but uh, before Prof. Madi presents, Prof. Uh, Dr. Michelle Groom will talk about the safety and immunogenicity of a parenteral uh, virus. Uh, that uh, she'd done on, on a multi-site randomized double 
fine, placebo controlled. So do you want to share? Uh, thanks, Dr. Michelle Groom, if you don't mind, I, I know that we've talked before, but would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself? I know that you all are part of the of the team which led by Prof. Mahdi, and we've also got Prof. Mahdi will speak on the COVID, COVID vaccine study, and then Portia Mutevedzi will talk about the TAM CHAMP CHAMPS HDSS that Prof. Mahdi has already mentioned. Um, is that all right, uh, Prof. Mahdi? Or do you want to lead the process? So perhaps if, I do, if you don't mind, uh, Michelle, you've already, can I start, perhaps start with quick, the COVID vaccine is not going to take too long. Yeah, go um, ahead. You can, you can organize it as you wish. Yeah, so let me start with COVID vaccine and I'll hand over to Michelle and Portia. I mean, uh, I think most people are aware of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. Obviously, it's the first uh, two vaccine studies that are being done on the African continent. The one is a vaccine that was developed at the University of Oxford, and the other one is a vaccine that's developed by Novavax, which is a biotech company. And these two vaccines are using very different sort of technologies uh, to develop the vaccine. The one is known as a vector-based vaccine, and uh, that's the University of Oxford vaccine. That is using a novel technology. The only time previously that technology has been used to successfully develop a vaccine is for Ebola virus. Uh, and that is the only vaccine that's been licensed during the course of this year, in fact, that uses that technology. Most of the COVID-19 vaccines are actually using this vector-based approach because it's a very adaptable platform in terms of being able to develop new vaccines. Once you've got a sequence of the pathogen and you understand which parts of the pathogen you want them to target. Uh, so that particular study has completed, is almost completed with enrollment. Uh, it's been done in Gauteng as well as in the Western Cape. Uh, and in terms of timelines, uh, so that particular study requires two doses of vaccine, which is spaced about a month apart. Uh, we started the study in about June, July, and initially we expected to be able to get an answer as soon as by the end of November from South Africa. But uh, for reasons which aren't yet fully explained, we had a very precipitous uh, downward turn of the epidemic in South Africa and a very little virus that's circulating. So the design of these studies is that you need to get certain number of people unfortunately need to develop COVID-19 before you can do an analysis to determine whether the vaccine protects against COVID-19 or not. So the timing in terms of when we're going to get to that certain number of cases uh, really depends on how much virus is circulating and how much people that are participating in the study uh, become exposed to the virus and end up with COVID-19. We don't wish that on anyone, but that's the nature of the virus and that's the nature of the studies that some people need to become sick to be able to understand whether the vaccine actually protects mm, again. Or not. So that is the Oxford vaccine. The Novavax vaccine, we're still currently enrolling into that study. And in fact, just recently, we've increased the upper age to 75 years. Uh, the Novavax vaccine uses a completely different approach. It's more of what we call a subunit based vaccine. So it uses sort of looks, takes a protein and mainly delivers a protein with an edgement on this immune response. Also, a two dose schedule. And right now we're about halfway through enrollment. That one has been done in uh, Gauteng, uh, in Western Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, as well as in uh, the Free State. In Gauteng, we've got two sites in Johannesburg, one in the inner city in Hillbrow, and one that's based uh, at Baraguan Hospital at my unit. And in fact, another site in Soweto, Soweto Clinical Trials uh, Unit. So we've got, in the, yeah, so we've got three sites uh, in, in Johannesburg. Uh, so that study is still enrolling uh, of what I mean, I've got my biases, obviously. Uh, but if you ask me to put my money down on this currently about 10 vaccines that are in phase three studies, mm -hmm. uh, which means that they sort of will be able to get an efficacy readout. If you ask me which of the vaccines uh, looks the best, uh, the vaccine that probably looks most promising is actually the Novavax vaccine. Uh, based on uh, the non-human primate studies, where they showed that after two doses of vaccine, you're able to protect those non-human primates, not just against uh, infection in the lung, but also infection in the upper airways. And that is really important for a vaccine from a public health perspective, because a vaccine that only protects against severe disease 
will go so far in terms of breaking the back of the pandemic. What you really require is a vaccine that can protect against upper airway infection. So that vaccine also assists in terms of breaking the chain of transmission. Yeah. Uh, and when we talk of herd immunity, herd immunity only arises when the vaccine is able to actually protect against transmission rather than just only against disease. Mm. So the Novavax vaccine candidate probably right now, in my mind at least, is the one that shows really great promise. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're still enrolling into the study. So if you guys are interested, I would suggest you visit the, the website, viratrack.co.za. It gives you a little information of the study. And just recently, we've actually expanded the age group to include individuals up to 75 years of age. Uh, previously, we were only enrolling up to 65 years of age. We're hoping to complete enrollment uh, within the course of the next three weeks into the Novavax study as well. And then again, after that, it's a follow-up of the individuals uh, to get adequate number of COVID-19 cases uh, for us to be able to do an analysis in terms of whether the vaccine protects against COVID-19 or not. So, so let me pause there and yeah. happy to take any questions from them. So when you're recruiting, if, if I may ask quickly, um, when you're recruiting, are you uh, basically looking at um, patients from within the community and then vaccinating them and then seeing if they're sick. So what is the recruiting recruitment process? You sort of said people should use the opportunity. If we have clinicians at primary care, what would your suggestion be to help them help you? Yeah, so we're looking for volunteers from anywhere. And right now we're actually looking for more volunteers in the upper age range, as well as volunteers with comorbidities uh, that are relatively controlled because we're wanting to make the data generalizable eventually. Uh, and when I'm talking of volunteers, I mean, we haven't had any, a shortage of volunteers for both of the studies. Each yeah. day, in fact, in the morning, we need to turn people away from the clinic uh, simply because there's too many people arriving and we don't have enough staff to actually right. uh, screen okay. all of them. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, we do wel welcome more volunteers, especially oh. this demographic that I'm referring to. Uh, so, like I said, the information, uh, people that might be interested, uh, that information is available on the website, vidatrack.co.za, vidatrack, V-I-D-A-T-R-A-C-K.co.za. I'll put it on the... On yeah, the put it in the chat group so that people yeah. get that link. And it gives you a little information of the study, and it gives you a screening tool in terms of whether you would be eligible or not. And then that sends it off and someone will get in touch with you. Mm. Uh, to schedule an appointment, or people can just pitch up to the clinics. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's in Essendon Street in Hubrow, and the other clinic is at Paragonas Hospital, just next to the nurses' residence, okay. where our unit is based. That's the RMPRU. Okay. Yeah. So, if you know, you mentioned earlier in our discussion about you know phase three vaccine trials, and that you might need that kind of. Um, network in is that speaking to these same vaccines are we talking about that and do you want to elaborate a little bit about that idea and what would you yeah. think is useful so that is to... not necessarily these vaccines it depends on which vaccine actually becomes available to south africa for public so, use mm. uh, so we right now we're not too sure and it obviously depends which of these vaccines are going to be successful yeah, and what the true. supply chain is going to be Mm. Uh, but once any vaccine, I mean, the type of uh, surveillance that would need to be done uh, is completely, is agnostic to vaccine. Sure. Yeah. We need the same approach in terms of looking at vaccine effectiveness, which is what we do in phase four studies. And you're going to need to use the same approach in terms of addressing issues around vaccine safety. Mm. Uh, so it's sort of agnostic to what vaccine is introduced uh, in terms of what we would need to do. And that's what I was referring to by the phase four studies. Uh, it's around safety as well as effectiveness. Yeah. Well, it's certainly a useful um, point of uh, collaboration, like you mentioned earlier, and with us talking about that as a begin point uh, in this collaboration between WITS and the universe and the district. Well, thank you for that, Prof. Mahdi. And I know that you might want to run off. So if thank you very much. Really appreciate you um, spending the time with us. Uh, we're going to uh, go further with your colleagues. Um, I'm not sure who would go next. Is it Michelle? Um, yeah, I'm happy to go next. All right, and then after um, that, I don't know if you want the video. It's saying I can't start my video because you've stopped it. But I'm happy oh, just sorry. to share my you screen. Can, if you share your screen and uh, <laughs> that's fine. Oh, you've disabled go. screening yeah. as well. So if you can just enable right. those. Have there. I have I done that? What have I done? Okay, let me just quickly check. Um, uh, 
ask us that. All right. Let's hope that works for you now. And then for the sh the screen sharing as well. All right. Let me make co-host. I think that should help you. <laughs> Sorry. Good. You should get that now coming through. Okay. Great. Thanks. Good. Is Portia on All the right. call? I see she's not joined us. Um, will she be joining us, uh, Dr. Prof. Mario? Um, yes, I'm actually on the call. Ah, all right, good. Yes. Sorry. Oh, so you're using the, I think what I see is Shabmari twice. All right, that's fine. Thanks, Portia, you'll go next. And so let me just double check then. If you, Portia, do you mind unmuting so I can just allow you know which one? All right, let me just uh, allow you yeah, to also share your screen. Okay, go for it, Michelle. Thank you very sure. much. All right. Um, yeah, so I think more than just kind of just giving a, an, an update on the trial, I thought I'd rather just give a little bit of an update on the work that mm -hmm. we have been doing and that we've recently published on um, rotavirus vaccines. Um, and so as you would know, we introduced um, the oral rotavirus vaccine in um, August 2009. So it's actually been um, over 10 years that we've been using the oral rotavirus vaccine. And that was introduced at a six and 14 week schedule. And that's currently what we're still using. And also just a reminder of the studies that we did um, after vaccine introduction, where we did a big vaccine effectiveness study, um, where we showed that there was a 57% um, effectiveness in children under two years of age. Um, and that. Um, that effectiveness was similar in children um, under one compared to those um, older than one and HIV infected, um, HIV exposed and HIV uninfected children. It was all effective in all of those. We also then um, looked at Baraguanath Hospital where we looked at all cause diarrheal hospitalizations um, where we had data from prior to vaccine introduction. And then um, you can see where Rotorix was introduced and we saw a marked decrease in all cause diarrheal hospitalizations at Barrow, especially in the under ones. Um, so really oral vaccines have had a tremendous impact on decreasing rotavirus disease. However, we do have some um, issues with the oral vaccines and it's not just rotavirus vaccines, but all oral vaccines do have some um, limitations. And so one of them is that um, there's very been demonstrated to be very high efficacy against um, severe rotavirus disease in high income countries, for example, in Europe and the US. And yet there's lower efficacy and immunogenicity um, in low middle income countries, um, kind of like in Africa and Asia. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, so interference by high levels of um, maternal antibodies, which we did show also um, in one of our previous studies, um, that especially after the first dose, there seems to be some interference with maternal antibodies, although this does seem to be overcome with subsequent doses. Um, rotavirus antibodies present in breast milk may also interfere with the vaccine take and with vaccine um, efficacy. We're also administering uh, the oral polio vaccine at the six week um, vaccine visit. So this may have some interaction as well. Um, there can be micronutrient, micronutrient deficiencies, for example, zinc. Um, in the low middle income countries, there's also much higher prevalence of um, enteric co-infections, especially with, with bacteria that are present in the gut um, and with differences in the microbiome in low versus high middle income uh, versus high income countries. Um, things like HIV infection may also play a part, although our HIV infection rates in children has decreased um, sub substantially. And more and more, there's also the impact of genetics. Um, which may affect the vaccine effectiveness. And for rotavirus, um, one of the, the things that really has been shown to have an impact is the histo blood group antigens, um, which is kind of the same um, grouping as the, the ABO, um, like blood groupings, but then there are also um, secreta and Lewis antigens that may have an impact. Um, and so some of our ongoing work is, is looking at this as well. Um, so there are quite a lot of reasons why the oral vaccines are not working optimally. So as I say, we had about 57% effectiveness, whereas in your higher income countries, it's a lot higher than that. One of the other issues with the oral rotavirus vaccine um, is that there's a small risk of intersusception, which was detected in, 
in several settings following immunization with both Rotorix and Rototech, which are the globally licensed uh, rotavirus vaccines. Um, and so the WHO really recommended that we monitor um, intersusception um, after introduction of the vaccine. Um, and so what we did then um, in South Africa was looking at the safety of the oral um, vaccine Rotorix. And so we started a, a large project with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, started intersusception surveillance towards the end of 2013. And we managed to get most of the pediatric surgery departments on board. Um, and so at eight different hospitals across South Africa. Um, and so we were enrolling any children that were coming in um, with, with confirmed intersusception. Um, and we collected um, information on their clinical presentation, their vaccine history. Um, we've also partnered with the surgeons. They were very interested to kind of have a look more in terms of the management. And so we collected data on that and they are busy writing up that paper. We collected blood to look at the impact of, of cytokines. Um, and we collected stool from both cases and controls. Um, to look at enteric pathogens to see if there was any potential um, links to etiology of intersusception. Because if the, you know, intersusception tends to be, usually has an unknown cause, although there are certain um, viruses that have been implicated in, in um, increasing the incidence of intersusception. And we also took histology specimens. So we enrolled all the cases. We also had controls, which were um, non-intersusception surgical patients. Um, and so we have managed to enroll almost 500 over the just over five year period. And so if we just have a look at our vaccine, so this is really a graph looking at the number of intersusception cases um, by age, and as well as the age of administration of um, the first and second doses of Rotorix. The coverage was very high. So in our cohort, we had 85% um, of them had received two doses um, with another 12 receiving um, a single dose and only 3% that had not received any rotavirus vaccine. And as you can see, the vaccine was given pretty much on time um, at 16 and 14 weeks of age. And the number of intersusception cases um, increased as with um, kind of global intersusception rates, which tend to increase at around three to four months of age with a peak at around seven to nine months of age. And this coincides with the second dose of um, rotavirus vaccine. And I think this is part of also why there has been, it's been so difficult to try and um, iron out the risk with intersusception because naturally occurring intersusception tends to occur at the same time that we're vaccinating these kids. Um, and so we could then have a look at the timing of the doses in relation to um, when they presented with intersusception. So we looked at the number of days between when they received the vaccination and the onset of their symptoms for the intersusception um, episode. And you can see that there, after the first dose of Rotorix, there were no cases of intersusception in that first week. And that has really been the period where we've seen in the high income countries where the greatest risk of intersusception is in those first seven days after the first dose. So we did not see cases during that time. There were a couple of cases in the first 21 days, um, but this was not really um, greater than, than what was seen later on at other age, at the um, greater ages. And after the second dose, although there were more cases, once again, we did not see this clustering of cases in the first week as has been seen in some of the other countries. And so after our case series analysis, we didn't see any significant association between intersusception and either the first or second dose of Rotrix. And there was no clustering in the risk windows that we had a look at. And this fits with data um, that did come out from the rest of Africa, where the African Intersusception Network um, also looked at um, several African countries and the risk of intersusception after um, oral rotavirus vaccines. Some of them were giving Rotrix and some giving Rototech. And there was also no increased risk um, of, of intersusception following either of the doses. And this may be linked, one hypothesis is that because the vaccine is actually not as effective 
um, on the African continent due to you know, those factors that I had highlighted, that maybe there is just less viral replication in the gut and therefore less risk of this leading to intersusception. Um, so I think this is really just positive in terms of the vaccine that we have and in terms of the risk benefits um, that definitely we are seeing dramatic decreases in um, hospitalizations from rotavirus and that we haven't seen the same risk of intersusception that has been seen in some of the other high income countries. And so the vaccine really is safe and continues to be of benefit. All right, so then just moving on to a little bit and, and bringing back, um, going back to some of the reasons for um, not um, having optimal efficacy with the oral vaccines. And so we have been looking at other alternatives and one option is to look at a parenteral or injectable rotavirus vaccine. And the rationale for this is that obviously the oral vaccine is, is, a, is a vaccine, uh, the vaccine virus replicates within the gut um, and with the parenteral vaccines, these one of the candidates and is a non-replicating rotavirus vaccine. It's given um, by intramuscular injection and so bypasses that need for intestinal replication. And so it may provide um, enhanced efficacy by um, kind of over bypassing kind of the, the issues um, such as the bacterial co-infections, the microbiome. Um, there may be a safety benefit, but because there's no replication of the vaccine virus, there would be no increased risk of intersusception. These vaccines can be produced at lower cost. They may be combined potentially with other injectable childhood vaccines into kind of a, a multivalent vaccine. And because they're not live vaccines, would be safe in children with severe immunodeficiencies. And so the vote, most advanced candidate is, uh, is the P2VP8 which is a subunit vaccine. So they've taken a part of the, the rotavirus um, and used the VP8 subunit part of it. I know you guys aren't mostly rotavirus experts. So it's just a part of the vaccine which they've been replicated in, um, in E. coli. Um, and this is a liquid formulation which is absorbed onto an alum, aluminum adjuvant and is given intramuscularly. Um, and just to mention that there's quite a rich rotavirus vaccine pipeline. There's several of other new oral vaccines. Um, there have been two vaccines from India, um, which are oral vaccines, which were produced and, um, and developed in India. And several of those vaccines are actually being tested currently in Africa um, with and are WHO pre-qualified. Um, so those are, are potentially um, will be used outside of India. And there are several other um, parental or um, uh, options such as CDC is busy making a, a killed, a whole killed vaccine. And so there really is a lot of um, work ongoing in terms of rotavirus vaccines and producing better rotavirus vaccines who may, which may be able to give us that added efficacy um, because obviously the more effective a vaccine is, the more lives and hospitalizations we can prevent. So for this talk, I'm really just focusing on the on this um, P2VP8 vaccine that we've been doing a lot of work on. And so obviously it showed a lot of promise in preclinical development, um, went on to clinical development with the first inhuman study in the US in 2012, 2013. Um, and this was a monovalent vaccine, which meant that it took the subunit of the most common rotavirus strain, which is a P8 strain. So the, the most important strains are, are P4, 6, and 8 strains. So it, it used the P8 strain. And in 2014-2015 at RMPRU, um, we conducted a phase one to study looking at safety and immunogenicity of this vaccine in toddlers and infants. Oh, sorry. Um, and so um, this was safe, well tolerated. We got very good antibody responses to the P8 strains, um, which was expected because this was the strain from which the vaccine was made. But there wasn't a lot of cross protection to the other strains. So what's been shown with the oral um, vaccine Rotorix, although it's also made from a P8 strain, there's a lot of cross protection with the other strains. Whereas with the parenteral vaccine, we didn't see that same cross protection. And so the, the immune responses to the P4 and P6 strains were much lower. 
Um, we also looked at quite a novel um, method of trying to see how if, um, efficacious this vaccine would be in that all these um, infants had to get um, a licensed product, which was Rotorix after they had received um, the study vaccine. And so after um, ro receiving Rotorix, we had actually measured the shedding um, with the premise that if they were protected, um, you would have reduced shedding of the vaccine virus. And in fact, we did see this um, with the monovalent vaccine. But because of the limited cross protection against the other strains, um, the vaccine was reformulated to then include um, a virus subunit from the other strains. So there was a trivalent formulation, um, which was then developed, which had the P4, 6 and 8 strains, which we then tested again um, in Soweto. And there was then inclusion of two other sites. And uh, this was done in adults, toddlers, and infants. We had to include the adults because it, it was a reformulation. And this was done in 2016 and 2017. And so um, for this study, it was a multi-center study um, where it was obviously conducted at us. And we had a, a good team of ladies heading up as PIs on the study with um, Lee Fairley um, from Shandukani and uh, Julie Morrison from uh, FAM crew in Cape Town. Um, and so we were looking at the trivalent vaccine. There were three different dosages that we were looking at because we didn't have a, a, a clear dose response in the previous study. And this was really a double blind randomized placebo controlled study. Um, and the reason that we could do a placebo controlled study, even though the oral vaccine had been introduced is that we limited enrollment um, to outside of the rotavirus season. And so there was a very low risk um, rotavirus tends to occur in the winter months, and so we enrolled all our participants outside of that peak area so that there was no increased or very small increased risk of them actually being exposed to rotavirus, a rotav yeah, rotavirus infection during that time. Um, so I won't go into too much um, detail in terms of, of the study, but the adults, we enrolled 30 adults and 30 toddlers. They, the adults received three doses, the toddlers received a single dose, and we took um, blood at various time points to be able to look um, both for safety and for immunogenicity. And then we enrolled a small um, cohort of infants, which had quite intensive safety follow-up. Um, and then it was shown to be safe in, in those infants and we went on to enroll a larger cohort of infants at all the sites. And once again, we also did give um, the Rotorix after receiving the study vaccine. And so we could look at shedding of Rotorix once again. Um, and so really the main endpoints for this was looking at safety. Was the vaccine safe? Were there any issues um, in terms of other um, local responses or local reactions or systemic reactions and whether there was immunogenicity and particularly immunogenicity against the different strains now that we had expanded the number of strains that were in, um, included in the vaccine. Um, and so from a safety point of view, we had looked at local reactions, systemic reactions um, and adverse events through the, through the study as well as severe adverse events. And we didn't see any differences between any of the treatment groups um, or the, um, compared to the placebo. Um, and so um, really we felt well, the, the, the vaccine was safe. Um, obviously it was, the placebo was normal saline. Um, if we looked at immunogenicity, um, so what we, we looked at um, IgG uh, response to the vaccine, as well as neutralizing antibodies, and those are the three strains, um, the three, the P4, 6, and 8 strains. And as you can see, compared to placebo, um, for both the IgG and the neutralizing antibodies, we had um, very good responses in the um, treatment groups compared to the placebo. The blue is after the second dose and the red is after the third dose. And so particularly for the neutralizing antibodies, you could see that much better responses after three doses than after two doses of the vaccine. And if we really uh, then looked at the shedding, um, we could see that there was um, significantly fewer infants vaccinated with the highest dose um, that shed ro Rotorix compared to the placebo vaccines. So remember, we'd given them a, a challenge dose of Rotorix and then looked at shedding. And so 
Therefore, those that reacted better, there was less shedding of the vaccine. Um, so based on the results of, of our study, um, this vaccine has now been further developed. And so it's, there's been a large phase three study, which has um, started actually towards the end of 2019, um, which is a double blind um, randomized active comparator controlled um, study, which really means that they are comparing three doses of the, of the parenteral vaccine to standard of care, which is two doses of Rotorix. Okay, so they'll be randomized either to receive three doses of the parenteral vaccine or the normal um, EPI, which is two doses of, of Rotorix. And then they would be followed up to have a look at who develops rotavirus diarrhea and who doesn't. And this study has been conducted in Malawi, Ghana, Zambia, and India. Um, and unfortunately was put on hold because of um, the COVID pandemic. Um, I think they have started re-enrolling. Um, and so that would really be able to show um, whether it's a non-inferiority study. So they're comparing um, the new vaccine to a licensed standard of care. We are also going to be looking at um, a prime boost regimen. And so the same as with, with polio, where there was the use of both the oral and injectable polio vaccine, um, we're also going to look at whether this is a possibility for rotavirus, where we can combine the live oral rotavirus vaccines with the parenteral vaccine. And so this study is going to be conducted in South Africa, um, and we will be looking at um, either a combination, giving the vaccines at the same time, so giving an oral and a parenteral at the same time, or giving the oral vaccine first and boosting it with the parenteral vaccine. And we're looking both at Rotorix, which is the vaccine which has been in use at the moment in our EPI, and we're looking at a new um, unlicensed oral vaccine called RB3BB, which was developed in Australia and is actually given as a neonatal dose. Um, and so those two vaccines will be, um, uh, comp will be compared. There'll be two um, groups, one receiving Rotorix, one receiving RB3BB, and then various combinations with the parenteral vaccine. And this is um, going to be conducted at our um, research site, VIDA, which is, was previously RMPRU, um, and once again with Lee Fairley um, at the Witz Shandakani Research Center. And really just a quick look, um, I think this protocol, we're awaiting approval from the Joburg Research Committee. Um, so this is really, there'll be the two groups. One will be enrolled at birth, where, where they'll be getting that birth rotavirus vaccine. Um, the other cohort will be enrolled at um, six weeks of age, and then there'll be different arms, either where they'll be getting the injectable vaccine together with the oral, or be getting the oral followed by the injectable. Um, and so it's quite a, a complex um, study with various arms, um, but the main endpoint is really to have a look at whether um, this prime boost um, type of strategy or a combination strategy will be able to um, increase the efficacy of the oral alone. And once again, we'll also be looking at stool shedding um, again. Um, so that really is just in a nutshell in terms of this new study. We were meant to actually start in September, but also because of the COVID pandemic, um, we are trying or well, aiming to start towards the end of Jan, early February. Um, where we'll be enrolling um, children either just shortly after birth, so it's between um, zero and six days following birth, or at six weeks of age, just before receiving their normal EPI vaccines. Um, they will then be they, they'll be seen at our research sites where we provide kind of all the EPI vaccines um, as part of the study, and so they will be getting their other EPI vaccines um, at the same time. Um, yeah, and really just to acknowledge all the, the key players in the studies that we have conducted um, over the years, um, as this will be the, the third study that we have conducted um, with this vaccine um, and with our funding from Bill and Melinda Gates and um, PATH has been the one um, that has been our sponsor through all of these studies. Thanks very much. And Thank I'll you very much, any Michelle. Questions. Yes, I, uh, I'm wondering if there are any questions. It doesn't look like there are any at this point. Um, 
but just a quick question, perhaps more very generalized question. Um, which um, sites have you been using generally within Soweto? Um, just a quick question. Yeah, so I think we've really been using our site at RMPRU. Right. Um, and so we, uh, we enroll from Krasani Barra from the maternity wards. And then right. we are trying to also get um, yeah, permission to enroll from some of the primary uh, clinics. Okay. Um, we've previously used Blenheim and Goy and yeah, to try okay. and enroll from there. And just a quick question about, you know, the timelines, uh, you know, when mm. might uh, this impact on the actual EPI? Just uh, a quick question so people understand how difficult it is, you know, what gets into, into the process before you see an immunization change? Yeah, so unfortunately, I mean, we have, as I said, we, I think we started these in 2015 kind of with the first study. And as you see, mm. like the, the one formulation wasn't, wasn't optimal, so we That's had to right. look at another formulation. Um, and I mean, the, the results of the study, I mean, we will enroll, we aim to enroll through the course of this year. And so we would expect results towards the end of kind of middle to end of next year, um, at least in terms of um, immunogenicity. Um, and look, obviously, it depends then in terms of how of favorable course. the results are. Um, because I think then, you know, the developers would need to decide if it's, you know, if it's if, if they pursue the, f the final formulation, would it be a standalone vaccine, which may mm. be problematic as our schedule is quite full already with, with injectable vaccines mm. or whether, you know, they would look at trying to combine it with kind of the hexavalent vaccine or, you know, there's also talk of, you know, there are norovirus vaccines in, in development as well, you know, and there are some some talk of kind of a, a diarrhea vaccine, you know, where you may have a combination of, say, a norovirus, rotavirus vaccine. So, yeah, so I'm sure it's going to be a few years before we would really uh, see sure. the impact of this. <laughs> well, often in time, people don't realize, you know, the, the extent of work and they disconnect. So I think, sorry mm. about the delays. I think uh, that's part of the cleaning up, you know. Oh, no, 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 that's so fine. Yeah, we no, hope we'll, we'll, we'll get your up. permission shortly. Yes, no, so that's that's fine. fine. Thank you very much, um, Michelle. Appreciate the presentation. Yes. Uh, the last presentation, Thanks. thank you. Uh, the last presentation will be by Portia Mutevedzi. And uh, Portia, you are okay, I think, to present? Yes. Good. Let me. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to share my presentation. It's saying you've disabled me from sharing. Well, let me do that once more. I think you should mm. be able to now do that. Is it popping up? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, it looks like. All right. Good. Well, thank you, Portia. I think uh, Portia Motovetsi is uh, working in the. And Portia, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit of your role and background. And. Um, and then you can talk about the CHAMS HDSS or HDS. Okay, um, let me just share, okay. Okay, can you all see my presentation now? Is it yes. sharing or? Okay? Yes, no problem, good. You might use so, a presenter mode rather than, or at least a sort of slightly different version. I don't know if there's a presenter or, or display. You can just check that, but it's fine. It's, it seems to be fairly okay. Um, is it's sort of using presenter mode. So if you just change that, I'm not sure of the presentation. Yeah, I present a view. That's is good. that better? Yeah, you just use the presenter there. Yeah, great, we'll go. Yeah. Is it on slideshow now? It, I think Chris Seed, it seems to be all right. I think you're somehow struggling to get it on slide view or presenter view there. You might try at the top um, slideshow. If you just click on slideshow on your menu at the top, you might succeed. Slideshow on the right. Yes, if you just go there. Yeah, maybe that'll get you there. You seems to not be spawning. Go for it, Portia. I think you're fine. It's much better than it was. You okay. can carry on with that presentation as it is. All right. Um, so in terms of uh, my background, I'm a senior epidemiologist at um, RMPRU, which is now MRC BIDA. 
And part of my responsibilities involve uh, running all the epidemiology studies that we have, and these include COVID-19 studies, uh, child health studies, as well as uh, running the HDSS. So uh, Professor Madi has already alluded to the CHAMPS program, which uh, basically is looking at identifying uh, causes of under five mortality um, in South Africa. And there are many sites across uh, the whole world, um, some in Africa and some in um, East Asia. And basically what we, undertake to do is to look at causes of mortality and then contextualize those to within the household to look at what household characteristics are associated with mortality, what community contextual issues are also uh, associated with mortality. So just to give you the face of chance and the different streams that we have, we basically have the household uh, demographic surveillance system, which collects all the information that's related to the community, households, as well as individuals within households. We also have a mix component where they collect um, minimum invasive tissue samples. And then these are assessed by a panel of um, members that includes uh, pediatricians, gynecologists, and other specialists that analyze these samples together with clinical data to come up with a cause of death. Within the whole mix is the social and behavioral sciences team, which for us is really the glue that makes our research su successful in that they act as a link between us, the researchers and the community. And on the far right hand side, you can see some of the community activities that the SBS team does within the community. So what the, the SBS team routinely does is before we go into the community to do any research studies, they go and do community mobilization. They work hand in hand with our community advisory board to make sure that the community is not only aware of our research, but they also understand it and they, they feed back to what would possibly work and what would work within um, our context. Uh, the pictures on the right also show the type of uh, community that we work in. The top picture is um, depicting Tembelife, which is an informal sector that borders Soweto. Um, in terms of the CHAM streams themselves and how they function, we have a hospital-based surveillance system that we use to record uh, hospitalizations as well as mortality. Within the surveillance, we've also built in death notification from uh, local mortuaries, as well as from other facilities surrounding uh, Chris Honey Barabana Hospital. So we get re reports, death reports from the community, from primary healthcare clinics, from the government mortuaries, as well as from undertakers. Once we have a death reported, we then uh, link in with the MITS team to go and collect the specimens and all other clinical information that is linked to the death. We have the HDSS team that goes, that visits uh, households within the Soweto community as well as in Tembelife to collect household related information. This HDSS rounds are done twice a year. And within that data collection, we look at population demographics, we look at household and community contextual factors, as well as other key individual variables that we don't necessarily get from the clinical records. The SBS team then links um, the research findings, the study findings with the community. And by that, I mean, they go and feedback results. They also go and have focus group discussions with the community in terms of making them understand causes of death and what, what can be done within the community context without use uh, mortality. In terms of zooming in now to the health and demographic surveillance system. So the, the main aim of the HDSS was to ensure that we get population information as well as um, denominators and provide context in which the deaths that are reported okay. So we, we aim to have population denominators to understand the population structure 
as well as to provide the contextual information that helps us to understand the context in which that happens. And this data is collected at the household level as well as at the community level. We also have um, a lot of community engagement with the community advisory board, just to look at uh, environmental transitions as well as community transitions that may affect um, deaths. The HDSS covers a well-defined population that includes eight clusters. These clusters were selected based on mortality rates. So we looked at uh, areas where the child mortality rate was 50 per thousand and above. And then we followed up these clusters. We've been following them up since 2018, and we're currently in round five of data collection. We also have an informal settlement uh, in Tembelife that we're currently following up together with the eight clusters in Soweto. Just to give an idea of uh, the areas that we're following up, the colored areas represent the clusters in which we work in, and Tembelife is low down here bordering um, Soweto. In terms of the major milestones uh, that we've managed to achieve so far, we have managed to follow up about 32,000 households from baseline right through to round five. This includes a total population of just under 125 individuals, about 10% of whom are aged less than five years. Annually, we observe about 1,300 pregnancies from a total population of 30,000 women who are aged uh, 15 to 45. And worth mentioning is that we do get a number of pregnancies in women aged um, above 50, as well as um, some in children that are aged younger than 15 years. In terms of the key results, before I go to the key results, our main uh, focus within the demographic surveillance is to look at deaths. We look at migration rates, and this has really been interesting within the COVID context just to look at how COVID and the lockdown measures have affected both in migration and out migration, as well as household formation and dissolution. Now to zoom into some key results that we have um, thus far. In terms of the under five mortality rates, uh, we see quite a variability across the different clusters. So even though our clusters were based on a mortality rate of uh, 50 per thousand and above, based on statistics South Africa uh, population stats, we actually see that once we are on the ground and start collecting data, there is huge variability in terms of the mortality rates, ranging from 23 per thousand in uh, middle and zone four to about 58 per thousand in Tulani. The Tembelike also has quite a high uh, mortality rate, um, sitting at um, 53 per thousand. In terms of places of death, which is um, um, an interesting finding that we get from the HDSS, so we're actually able to go back to all the deaths and determine where the deaths uh, occurred. We additionally link the deaths that happen within the HDSS with those that happen in the health facilities. Within the HDSS itself, we find that 43% of deaths okay within the health facility, but 41% of the deaths okay within uh, households. And for deaths that happen within the household, these are really reported, especially if they're neonatal uh, deaths. So we find even when we're collecting the data, we need to prop the, the households much more, and we also need to link in with pregnancy observations for us to get to the total number of um, neonatal deaths. In terms of distribution of the health facility death, the bulk of the deaths okay at Chris Honey Baragwana Hospital and um, second highest ranking is uh, Bekim Langeni. We don't see a, a huge number of uh, community is being notified of health facilities themselves. We have a couple that are reported as death on arrival, and these are either deaths that will have um, happened in transit or deaths that happened before the patient is admitted into a uh, hospital. And then in terms of if we zoom into um, the decode results from the MITS team, so based on the minimum invasive tissue sampling 
and the decode panel results. We uh, see really interesting results in terms of preventable causes of death. And this uh, follows on to what Prof. Madi was mentioning earlier that through the CHANCE program, we are able to really zoom in and look at what are the causes of mortality, where is mortality occurring, and what can be done to prevent child mortality. So if we look at infection control, that's, that's actually the bulk of the death that we are see, seeing sitting at 128 of the total of 518. And these are deaths that could potentially be preventable by um, implementing stringent in, in infection control measures. We also have a significant proportion that are due to antenatal care, lack of antenatal care, or lack of interventions that could potentially have been done um, during antenatal uh, visits. Now moving on to, so within the HDSS itself, it's, it's really a great utility to use in terms of either um, measuring interventions, the impact of interventions at the community level, as well as also just monitoring disease uh, trends, looking at access to healthcare services, looking, to change, looking at changes that happen within a health transition and environmental transitions. So the HDSS itself, we have utilized it and it has proved to be a really useful uh, tool. And also to mention that we link in with data that we get from the primary healthcare clinics in addition to the hospital that the hospitals that we work in. So for example, all the health facilities, primary health facilities in Soweto, when we get a report of a death or a birth or vaccination, we go on to ask them within which health facilities are they receiving these services. How do they view the services? Are they adequate? What are some of, some, sort of some of the challenges that they have? And the main aim of collecting this data is so that we can feed back to um, the Department of Health at the district as well as the provincial level to inform on um, health improvements as well as service delivery. Um, the major challenges in implementing an HDSS, uh, so in as much as it's useful and its utility is really immeasurable, there are major challenges when you look at implementing HDSS within an urban population. So our HDSS is uh, the second urban uh, HDSS with one being in Kenya. The bulk of demographic surveillance sites are based in rural areas. And some of the challenges that we have encountered in implementing our HDSS has been the issue relating to locked gates or inaccessible households. And this is because the bulk of our participants or the, bulks of, the bulk of individuals that are in our HDSS are working class. So during the day when we visit the households, we either find that there's only children in the household or there's nobody at all within the household. So we've had to implement very innovative measures to try and make sure that we uh, get access to participants and we're able to collect the required data. We do repeat visits up to a maximum of three visits for each household that we can't access. We've also gone down the route of doing telephonic um, appointments, but this is also a problem because within this setting, people change phone numbers, and um, they sometimes are not really willing to give um, their phone numbers for fear of being traced for other reasons. We also adjusted working hours. So our data collection now is currently from Tuesday to Saturday, and we start around nine and finish around five, six. In certain instances, we actually do uh, visits during public holidays as well as on uh, Sundays. We also have significant refusals and non-response, and this is mainly based on security issues. So in a lot of the clusters that we visit, they raise uh, concerns that they are not very sure um, if it's safe for them to let us in and issues like that. And how we resolve this is to work with uh, the local community advice board as to work with street committees so we engage with strict committees and they go before the data collection rounds and they conscientize the community that we are coming and will be collecting data. In addition, we also do community activities such as road shows. We do um, 
campaigns, with street campaigns where we walk within streets and help with cleaning up of those streets. By so doing, uh, creating awareness of the HDS, the HDSS platform as well as its uh, utility. We twice a year we visit each cluster to also provide feedback on the results that we are seeing, and we assist the community to implement ways in which they can improve health in general as well as um, child health within the community. So within, um, in a nutshell, that, that highlights our HDSS. And we are open to any studies that students would want to do or studies that the Department of Health would want to do that would uh, benefit from the demographic surveillance system, as well as from the longitudinal data that we have been collecting since uh, 2018. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Portia, and really appreciate you sharing that on the uh, CHAMPS project. Um, I think it offers great opportunity for researchers and uh, students, I think, as you've said, um, to access the data that you have. And I think uh, certainly from Johannesburg, uh, we'll encourage them to approach it. And maybe we can have a, find a way to understand it a little bit better about the data that you're collecting and what is the possibility um, to look at what kind of data are you looking at that we could think about. Um, the other qu the question that I had was um, uh, was about the uh, data, um, uh, the, the kind of data that you showed about the causes of death. I don't know whether we could have a way to get more insight as the Johannesburg Health District about what you found um, in some of the areas uh, within Soweto. Um, as to preventable deaths. And there were some quite um, notable um, challenges. I think the orange bar chart has got the higher one. Oh, yeah, this one basically shows the kinds of, you know, what, what you mean by infection control. Perhaps we could look into the data that you've collected and understand it a little bit better, and particularly in relation to some of the areas that you're looking at, uh, what are the kind of preventable things and what might we uh, inform managers in facilities that this is the kind of deaths occurring in this, the vicinity. Um, how, how, um, how robust, I mean, the, the, the sort of sample that you have of population, is that a sampled population in those areas? And you have a sort of prospective follow-up of those people that you've sampled out of those communities. Is that uh, how it pans out? or is it related to deaths? Just give us an understanding of how the data collection happens and how it might inform the managers that this is kind of happening in your community, what that means. Okay. So the data collection essentially is two-pronged. We have data that we are collecting within the midstream. That's and right. this is basically whenever a death is reported, we uh, determine eligibility and currently our eligibility criteria also includes being resident within our HDSS clusters. Right. So once we have determined that the death is within our HDSS cluster, we then approach the family to uh, do the inv minimally invasive tissue sampling. Once that is done, we also ask for consent to get uh, clinic-based records and hospital-based records to get the right. clinical picture. The second uh, prong is the HDSS, and this basically includes the eight clusters that I was alluding to, and we mm. follow each and every individual within those clusters. So we don't do any sampling, we follow the whole population that is right. within that demarcated area. And we follow them up prospectively, we visit each household twice a year. Right. Household data in terms of socioeconomic status and assets and um, availability of uh, utilities, we collect that once a year. And then in addition, we implement modules. So for example, this year we have a health seeking module, which is really directly related to COVID-19, where we ask people have their health seeking behavior changed and how has COVID-19 and the COVID-19 control relations impact on them. So our data sets are in two forms. One, which is purely looking at uh, meets lab tip and the clinical information, and one that is based on our demographic surveillance site and looks at um, 
what's happening within the, the households as well as at individual level. In terms of uh, what you were asking that falls under infection control, we actually have very granular data that goes into that in terms of what sort of pathogens were detected, which of those were hospital acquired compared to community acquired, mm. and uh, whether or not they were resistant to uh, drugs or if they were susceptible. So we do have all that information. And some of the data has been used at Bada Hospital to try and implement um, infection control and reduce um, the prevalence of drug resistant uh, pathogens. And nosocomial infections. Yeah. yeah, no, that's useful. Um, has um, would you be able to share the? I'm not sure whether Prof. Mahdi would be able to answer that as well. But share the the survey questionnaires, um, you know, online or to the DRC, so that we could understand the data that is being collected. And the other question I have is: Have you shared this with the uh, the, clin the the sort of facility managers of clinics in that vicinity? Um, just to make them aware of some of this data? So I think we can potentially share with you if Prof. Madi doesn't uh, object to that, we can share our questionnaires. And I think it would really be helpful if we share them because we, we collect a lot of data elements from employment, education, who's the household head, yeah. death and migration and all that. So it would be, I think it would be more informative if we can share those um, elements with you. Yeah. Then in terms of sharing the data, we did present at one of the COJ district uh, managers meetings beginning of this year, I think it was around February, March. And the agreement with the district management team was that we'll be attending all their quarterly meetings and giving them an update. But then unfortunately, uh, COVID happened and we haven't been able to feedback. With Bara Hospital, we do give a uh, uh, frequent updates and part of the some of the uh, specialists within our depot team are also part of the Bara Hospital um, staff members, so they do feedback to the hospital itself. But we would quite like to do much more, even in terms of just producing quarterly reports that we share with the primary health care facilities that we work in, as well as uh, the district uh, health teams. Uh, Prof. Madi, I think you would like to respond. Yeah, I mean, so I think we, it's important to put this uh, CHEMS program into context. This is not research. Hmm. This is really meant to be surveillance. And the okay. purpose behind the surveillance is to be able to provide timely information uh, to exercise changes in terms of healthcare where we identify gaps. That is the real purpose of the CHEMS program. Uh, the data, in fact, is uh, available almost in its totality uh, to anyone that wants to access it. Uh, because one of the agreements with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, is that all data that's generated is actually made uh, available in the public domain in as real time as possible. Okay. Uh, so again, another example of just ample opportunity of leveraging mm, on, on data that's routinely collected. Yeah. And we would be failing in a program if we don't actually uh, disseminate the data, make it available, and try to get the healthcare providers to actually action mm. uh, where we are identifying gaps. And that is the main focus of this program. Well, that's great. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. And I don't see any more questions. So let me just end off with this. I think there's plenty of opportunity, like we say, for us as uh, the district the, you know, in which the university is sitting, um, to be able to collaborate and see how we can strengthen, um, you know, good quality research and research that makes a difference. Um, and I think you've provided plenty of a plenty of ideas for us to take that forward. And we certainly will look at that. I think one of the key things that um, I think whilst we want to start simple, uh, we would probably want to ask, you know, do we uh, do we take it forward by including as many of the key stakeholders? I'm sure you'll make the judgment. Um, in the university that um, that are well invested in looking at this collaborative as a university-wide effort to, to link the university um, strongly to the community of Johannesburg, which it serves. So, uh, Dr. Mahdi, Prof. Mahdi, if you have any, sorry, I think I have two questions popping up. Um, the question I think Dr. Prof. Chirwa asks, uh, 
can you on decode results, uh, Portia, I think it's linked to what you said. Can you explain the 42%? Um, I think he's not sure about whether it's a verbal autopsy. Uh, and then he asks a question of any link linkages with GRT. I'm not sure whether you understand, but Prof. Chirwa, perhaps you want to um, speak and clarify. I can allow you to do that. Um, any response so far? I'll just ask for Prof. Chirwa to, to just speak if he needs clarity. Prof. Chirwa, do you, you want to, do you, Tobias, do you want to just share that more clearly, your question? Yeah. Go ahead. No, th th thanks a lot. I think this is very, very interesting. I was asking about the 42% because I was not sure whether it was actually uh, decoded. Um, and uh, if, if not, whether there were thoughts about uh, use of verbal autopsy. Um, I think that was that was my question. And then the, the other one is, I think, uh, Prof. Mad is aware of the Houting Research Triangle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also looking at uh, developing an ad urban DHSS. But I think, um, uh, Prof. Madi and group are a bit ahead. I don't know, and I don't know whether there were any linkages with that particular group at the moment. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, so I probably could answer both questions. Yes, so, go uh, ahead. We do do a verbal autopsies on the cases where we do MITS as well as the cases where we don't do MITS, so what we call a non mits cases. So we do verbal autopsies on uh, all of them. Uh, the verbal autopsies are currently being analyzed in terms of sensitivity and specificity against the gold standard of uh, what the BECO panel comes to with regard to cause of death attribution. Uh, I mean, just I can let you know, what I can tell you is that as you probably know, verbal autopsies are lacking in terms of specificity. And uh, at the end of the day, when we look at the BECO cause of death attribution, uh, verbal autopsies are probably no better than a toss of a coin in terms of attributing cause of death. Uh, so all of this dependency that you've placed on verbal autopsies, which has never been validated against uh, actual biological autopsies, uh, has been very much misplaced. Uh, and in, in addition to which, obviously, verbal autopsies can't give you pathogen-specific causes of death for infectious diseases. So we've, there's a lot of verbal autopsy data that's available from across the different uh, places where this has been done. Uh, but it's really, in fact, if anything, the CHEMS program indicates the extreme limited value of the use of verbal autopsies for cause of death attribution. Uh, in terms of the second question, yes, I'm aware of the, the other DSS that's been funded by SEFRIN, which includes that's UP and I think uh, UJ. Uh, we have had some discussions with them in terms of how we can try to synergize activities or at least support uh, each other's activities. So I think that's a discussion that we'll move ahead with uh, next year as well. No, thank you for that. Um, to appreciate uh, you know all the presenters. I think we've come about to the end of our time. Prof. Madi, any closing remarks? And uh, then we can close. Thank you and your team for presenting. Uh, appreciate the audience. Any closing remarks? Yeah, so I mean, thanks for the opportunity for having us present. And like I said earlier, I look forward to us strengthening the relationship between both the district as well as the province and the faculty mm. and hoping to count on your support as we move it forward. Certainly. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you all for attending. This uh, webinar will be is taped and it will be in available at, on the post um, in a day or two. So thank you all. And uh, you can refer to that uh, for records. I've asked for the presentations and they'll be put along there if, if we get permission to post them. Thank you all very much. Uh, be safe, go well, bye-bye.